frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Don't you understand, George? It's because you were not born. Film church. Well, a, a boy's best friend is his mother. You see, in this world, there's two kinds of people, my friend. Those with loaded guns and those who dig. You dig. Hello, and welcome to Film Church Radio, the podcast that treats cinema as a religion. It's Sunday. I'm Brandon. And I'm Lewis. And we are here to talk about movies as always. This is the fourth in a special series of episodes where we have been going through the filmography of Sergio Leone. Uh, normally, each week, Lewis and I alternate picking a different film for both of us to watch and discuss. Sometimes it's stuff that neither one of us has seen. Sometimes it's stuff that we want the other one to see so that we can dissect it. Um, but we decided to go through the entire filmography of Sergio Leone because I had been wanting to do a rewatch of some of his films and hadn't seen all of them. And then when I asked Lewis about it, he hadn't seen any of them. So That's I was right. like, okay, we got to do this. Go through the entire thing. So I've been super excited um, each week to talk about each film with Lewis and, and get his thoughts on them. And we're finally here to the incredible, the amazing, the one and only, the good, the bad, and the ugly from 1966, starring Clint Eastwood, Lee Van Cleef, and Eli Wallach. Uh, before we get into the episode, we just want to say thank you to everybody that's been listening to the podcast and sending their love for the show. Uh, if you're new to the show and are enjoying it, be sure to subscri subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when a new episode is available. Uh, this is a film church, so we post episodes every Sunday. And if you really, really enjoy the show, please share it with your friends. Uh, you can find us on all the social media platforms as well at Film Church Radio, where you can leave us a comment or send us a message about the show. Um, we'd also love if you would rate and review the show if you'd like, um, wherever you're streaming our podcast from. Uh, before we get into the film as well, we like to just chit chat a bit about what we've been watching for the week because sometimes it can influence our thoughts about the movie that we're talking about this week. So, Lewis, how have you been watching? Yeah, it's been a real, um, like, dry week in terms of films for me. Um, yeah. I watched um, Kurosawa's Throne of Blood. I seem to be really drawn um, to Kurosawa at the moment in, like, when I have for some, real? a yeah. spare few hours, I'm like, I'm going to watch another Kurosawa film. Yeah. Um, so this was Throne of Blood, um, starring Mifune again, um, and it's kind of, I mean, it's his take on Macbeth. So it's a story okay. that I knew pretty well, and um, we had obviously watched the um, the new Macbeth with Denzel yeah. Washington for the for yeah. the Oscars. So the story was still quite new in my head, but it was you know obviously in Japan and kind of um, changed a little bit. The story was a little bit different. Um, and it was it was so good. I mean, yeah, it was just some of the visuals, especially like he changes that a little bit. So it's not three witches that they come across. It's like an older guy, but he's in like a hut, and it's just so bright, and there's just smoke in like a forest, yeah. and the visuals are so striking. And um, I forget the name. Let me just look it up. But the 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 wife who plays the Lady Macbeth character um, in this is just so chilling. You know, all the yeah. way through, um, she's kind of the one that is obviously influencing his decision um, yeah. to do it all. Um, where is it? Izuzu Yamada. I might have just butchered that, but she was great. Um, and there was one scene where she kind of went into the back, um, like went through a door into darkness and like the darkness kind of like, like closed around her. And then she yeah. would like come back out carrying a tray of like the poison sake or whatever. Um, and it was just incredible, you know, to say that a story that I feel like I know really well and I've seen a lot to add something new to it and still be fresh, I think is, you know, yeah. the sign of something really great. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I've, I think it's interesting that you've been watching so much Kurosawa while we've been 
you know, diving into Sergio yeah. Leone, I feel like there's probably a a parallel there. I mean, um, definitely with you know the beginning of the Dollars trilogy, there was definitely the the combination of the two. Yeah, you know, but he, yeah, I mean, he obviously was influenced by him, and like Kurosawa is such a visual director. I mean, he, there's so many. I mean, any any film of his that I watch, I'm just blown away by the, the yeah the technicality of the image. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, it's not, the story isn't always the thing that you remember the most. It's the visuals and the way that, yeah. you know, he kind of, he positions his camera and it's all very, um, I don't know, it's just, it's unobtrusive. You never feel like he's showing off, um, you know, but it just, it's just, a, he's a great storyteller. Yeah. Um. And I'm really enjoying kind of going through his films. I mean, Throne of Blood, I think, is a really good place to start for anyone that's wanting to go, you know, make that jump over to kind of foreign film, especially Kurosawa, because it is, like I said, it is Macbeth. So you already know the story. Yeah. Um, But just see those influences that um, can only come from Japan, really. Um, And then we watch Doctor Strange. You know, the new one is coming out in like less than a week. Um, Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen Doctor Strange for a while. So we went back and watched it. Um. I think the trouble is, right, and I, I enjoyed it. This is going to sound like I didn't. I enjoyed it. But yeah. with what's come since for these Marvel films, when you go back and you watch, like, an origin story, it feels a little flat. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. in the last few years, we've had, you know, Endgame. We've had Infinity War. We've had No Way Home. We're going to have mm-hmm. Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness it's just ramping up. So when you go back and it's just like, Oh, it's just, you know, how it just became a, Dr. Strange. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's kind of a bit. And it feels like flat. a very short movie. Like, the yeah, one, the, it's like the an hour and 40 I've, minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And it feels like, it's just like, Oh, we're at the end now. Yeah. Like when you get there, um, I, I, but the visuals, I remember being incredible, like him yeah. flying through space and stuff. Oh yeah. And, like the opening when they're in, I think it's London and like the, you know, the buildings are just um, a change in and it's flipping mm-hmm. inside out, upside down. Inception kind of style. Yeah, it's just, I mean, the, the visuals are really, really good. And I yeah. like the end um, when they're in the kind of the street. I don't know what country it's, it's in. Maybe it might be Japan. Um, but how it kind of reverses through time. Yeah, and you can see people kind of like the cars are like going back to not, you know, all that kind of stuff. I find really cool, and yeah. it's like it's good to watch. But like I said, it's just like it's another origin story. It's not anything that kind of is ramping up for anything further, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we've just been watching a lot of TV. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I've I watched the whole um, they call me Magic documentary on Apple TV okay. about Magic Johnson. Um, Basketball yeah. is not something I've ever really been that interested in. Um, and then I watched the, um, I think it was on Netflix, the ESPN, the ESPN documentary on the Chicago Bulls with Michael yeah. Jordan and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's that that's incredible. That documentary, like to say I had no idea about basketball, I didn't know anything about the NBA or the league or anything like that. Holy smokes. It's, it's like riveting. It's so interesting. Yeah. Was Michael Jordan, I mean, we're – we're not that far apart in age, but yeah. we grew up in different countries. Yeah. I mean, Michael Jordan was like the Everyone. biggest thing yeah. on the planet when I was like a little kid. Yeah. Was so, he... I mean, I don't think so. I can remember like the, the place that I know most is obviously Space Jam. Okay. But that might be because I like films more than sport. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. But I remember like, like I knew of him, you know, I don't think I'd ever put it together that he was as big as like other kind of sports heroes. You yeah. Know? I just remember like anytime I was a kid and I would play basketball with other kids, everybody would try to slam dunk and stick their tongue out. Like, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was just the thing. Like it just like, just, he just infiltrated yeah. the minds of everyone. I mean, you can see why you watch that documentary and it's infectious. Yeah. Like he is so, I don't know. It's just like the most interesting athlete. Um, so when then th- this came on and another kind of basketball persona that I had, I knew about, but didn't know anything about, you know, I knew Magic Johnson was this big, you know, basketball star. 
And it's four episodes and the first two are kind of like his basketball career and the second two are more like after basketball. And it was so interesting. Again, it's just like, you know, kind of what drives him, you know, the people that influenced him, the kind yeah. of a lot about America at the time, you know, with race and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, it was just fascinating. And like I said, four episodes long, it never felt like it was kind of going on a bit too long or anything like that. So yeah, yeah, it was great. Well, that that's awesome, dude. Uh, I'm going to have to give that a watch. I, yeah. I like historical documentaries. Yeah. If you haven't watched the Chicago Bull ones, that's the one to watch. I can't okay, remember. Cool. I th- is it called The Last Dance? I think. That sounds right. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't watched it, but I remember seeing all the advertising for it. Yeah. It, I mean, it blew me away. Yeah. And that's a little bit longer. I think that's like eight episodes. Sweet. So. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, this week for me, I've also watched a lot of TV, but um, it's also been a, a series of rewatches with um, one film that I hadn't seen before, but yeah. I rewatched the Batman because it's on HBO yeah. Max. Um, still really great. It's still not like a like a five star for me. It's more yeah. of a four star. Um, that might change, I think. Yeah. Especially as I see like the other films and where it goes. Um, it does feel a I bit mean, weighty in the middle. I'll give you that. Line. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know what it is. It's just, I think maybe it's just because it's tonally, it just seems more of the same. Yeah. You know, from like yeah. the Dark Knight trilogy and stuff. And it's like, it it feels weird that we're just doing this again. Yeah, I know what like you mean. Like we're rebooting Batman again. Yeah. Um. You know, like if this if if the Dark Knight trilogy didn't exist, this movie would be like amazing. Like it yeah. would be a five out of five. But I think it's just because we I've been so saturated by Batman that it's yeah. like, you know, it just feels more of the same. But but they did it really really well. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like more of the same. But they they like the casting is incredible. Like I do like the whole detective side of of Batman and everything. One thing um, that I really liked about it, like rethinking it, was that. Um, the villains that are in it they kind of they all cross over you know normally you get oh this is the villain for this film this is the villain for that film and right. in reality that wouldn't you know you would have all these people kind of plotting at the same time maybe not becoming a problem until certain points but I like right. the fact that the penguin was in it but he wasn't like disposed of at the end right like exactly. he's had his yeah. run and he's still there same with the Joker obviously same with the Riddler like they're all still there yeah, uh, you know, and it's just setting it up for, for more. It's just gonna, yeah, you know. And I like that side of it. I like that it wasn't necessarily, you know, I've got to kill this one bad guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to see where it goes because I want to see. I want. I want to see more of the Bruce Wayne story. I think, and yeah. and how he overcomes his his challenges because it's like Batman was already Batman when the movie started, but yeah. Bruce Wayne isn't really Bruce Wayne yet. Yeah. You know, he's still kind of figuring out who he is, I think. Um, yeah. And I think I just, I'm ready for more of the story. Nice. But that's not, that's not necessarily a negative about the film. Yeah. It just means I'm interested, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we went and saw everything everywhere all at once. My second time seeing it. Um, it's, it's interesting. Like it's, it, you know the like obviously the movie is incredible like yeah. i was blown away the first time i saw it um it's interesting as like from a filmmaking perspective watching it again cuz i was kind of able to i saw a lot more like yeah. in my mind like coming out of the movie i was like how did they do that like that, that was incredible and then like watching it again i can be like oh here's how they did this here's how they did that yeah and it is amazing like how simple the film is because it definitely doesn't feel simple no, like yeah. coming out of it but like when you break it down like it's not a ton of locations and yeah. for the for the the way they make it seem like there's a ton of locations there's only like all the locations where there's where everyone's not in it and it's only two people it's just those two people yeah like they don't they don't have to take this entire big cast to all these different locations they can just yeah. take the two actors um 
because it's really just the the laundromat and the tax office that they're in most of the time. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. The crowd was not as enthusiastic as they were when you and I went. Okay. <laughs> this so, is like the sixth week that it's been out, though. Yeah, exactly. So it's so. like yeah, it was expected. Um. But it is interesting, like the. I, obviously, I think like when an audience when when it's packed and no one has seen the movie, like it heightens the experience so yeah. much. Yeah. Um. That, like, I saw it with two people that hadn't seen it, um, and they really liked it, but they definitely weren't like I was when I came out of the theater. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, seeing it for the first time, so it it is. I, I mean. I don't know if I have anything really else to say about that other than it's just interesting how much an audience can influence yeah. your take on a movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, the place and setting like has a lot more to do with how people enjoy movies than I think critics give it credit for, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Um, but I'm sure the critics love this movie anyway, but. I don't know. I haven't really looked it up, but <laughs> I know. Yeah, I, I kind of I suggested to my parents that they go and see it because um, it's coming out in England soon. Um, yeah, and I'm a little apprehensive as to what they'll think because I yeah. did tell them I was like, just got to go with it. Like, it's gonna seem weird and like, yeah, you know, a bit offbeat, but like at the core, it's a very universal message. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know. it's it, and I wish I uh, like. I love the movie. I like. <coughs> I wish that it was something I could suggest to my parents, you know. Yeah. But they would they they don't watch R rated movies, so it's like yeah. Um. Yeah, it's it's not exactly <laughs> something I could suggest. Yeah, to them. no, I know. Yeah, but I want them to see like that universal message that you're talking about, you know, and like share that with them a little bit. Um. <laughs> but I might just have to make that film myself. Yeah. <laughs> the PG version. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nearly everything. Nearly everywhere. Kind of at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Brandon Selman take. <laughs> you know, I like if I really wanted to, I could take the movie and edit it myself. And, like, <laughs> take all the cussing out and like the blur things. And, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, here you go, mom and dad. It's a PG version. <laughs> it's only 40 minutes. That's yeah. right. <laughs> um, but I don't think I have the will to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It would take a lot of work. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, anyway, after that, I watched Sonic the Hedgehog because people have been like talking about yeah. the new one. And yeah. I hadn't seen the old one. And, and the old one's pretty good. Like, yeah. I mean, not old old one, but like the first one came out a few years ago yeah um yeah it's pretty good um i should have looked up the actor's name i can't think of him he plays john ralphio and yeah Parks and ben Rec. schwartz yeah ben schwartz he's like he's so good dude yeah like, dude. it's it's good hearing his voice he's such a good <laughs> actor um and he, <clears throat> excuse me like anybody could have played sonic you yeah. know what i mean but he like elevated it and and made it like really great Jim Carrey is really great yeah. um, as Dr. Robotnik. And it was like a really fun movie. It was good. Um, That's good. I've, I've been, you know, I've seen a lot about the new one. So I think we'll have to check out the old one at some point. Yeah. Yeah. It's Maybe on, with Amelia. She'll probably like it. Yeah. It's on something. I can't remember what we watched it on. It's yeah. streaming somewhere on something. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And then last night we ended up putting on Daredevil from 2003. Oh yeah, <laughs> and I hadn't watched it in a really long time, and it's funny, dude. Like I remember watching that as, you know, a yeah. thirteen, fourteen year old kid, and being like, "This is so dark." I know, and good, and yeah. like, I'm, like that amazing, dude. It's like, like every single cliche line you could think of was in that movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it it was pretty bad. <laughs> But still yeah. enjoyable. Like, <laughs> like there's some nostalgia there from yeah. you know watching it as a kid. Like, I, I don't hate the movie or anything like that. Um, but yeah, it just especially everything that's come since then. Like, it's amazing yeah. that like 
I mean, it, it's like it came out the same year that Spider-Man 1 did. And I feel like that holds up so much better. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so just kind of crazy. The, you know, everything else that was going on. But, I mean, it's like also Morbius came out this year. You know, yeah, it's exactly. Like yeah, this same year as Multiverse of Madness and yeah, a lot of other great films. And uh, it's like, yeah, it's it's weird that I don't know. This, I guess, it's like with any movie, sometimes you hit it, sometimes you miss yeah. it, but yeah, <laughs> I remember like as a kid, like same as you, I thought it was great, but then again, I was a massive fan of the Fantastic Four films, so. Yeah. I don't think, yeah. you know, my taste then should influence <laughs> me now. So <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um Yeah, man. It was it it was it was cool to watch after watching like we've been watching the T V show recently. Yeah. And uh you know, seeing who plays all the different characters and stuff. Yeah. Uh is kind of fun to watch. And then um Kevin Smith shows up in the movie, which is great. He's got a cameo. <laughs> it's like there he is. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. Anyway, it was uh, it was fun to laugh at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's one of those films that I don't know if I'm ever going to go back to. Yeah, you know? exactly. I, I mean, I we happen to go back to it. Um, my girlfriend had never seen it, and she's been watching the show with me, so I think she. She enjoyed Wanted to see what it's come. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um if it wasn't for that, I probably wouldn't have rewatched it, but that'll probably be the last time I ever watch it. Unless <laughs> I I don't know, man. You never know because like sometimes I mean, Maybe. especially as years go on, you wanna show people things that have never seen. Yeah. You know, I mean that was the reason we watched it. I was showing it to my girlfriend who had never seen it. It's like especially as the superhero genre keeps evolving you know, show people the origins of where things come from and stuff. And maybe I'll have to uh, pick it for a future episode. Yeah. <laughs> the daredevil episode. <laughs> <laughs> maybe so. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's it on movies. I watch a few TV shows. Uh, yeah. Mainly. I feel like we're in a massive, like a huge, I know golden period, not golden period, but you know, like this time of year, there's a lot, of shows that I'm like, I want to watch that. I want to watch that. You oh know? yeah. Yeah. There's so much. Dude. Yeah. We watched like four different shows this week, like one episode from each. Cause every yeah. day I'm like, there's something, you know, there's moon night, mm -hmm. there's severance that we're watching now because of your recommendation. Yeah. Um, there's the, the Andrew Garfield Hulu show. And then we started the John, um, Berthenthal HBO drama last night. Okay. So there's just so much, you know, yeah, so there's, much out there. Dude, there is a lot. All the money is going into TV right now. It's kind of wild. Yeah. But, yeah, there's no shortage of entertainment. Yeah. Notice how all those shows were not on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with those guys, but hopefully they'll get Putting it together. Putting all their eggs in the Stranger Things basket, I think. I guess, yeah. So, bizarre. Yeah, it's a weird time for Netflix. Yeah. But, I mean, we kind of saw it coming. It was yeah. like, I mean, people were saying this, like, as before Disney Plus came out, people were like, oh, it's going to wipe them out. And they didn't really wipe them out, but, I mean, there's just so many options now. Yeah. I mean, the one streaming service I'm probably getting the most from at the moment is HBO. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that the fact that they've got, I mean, TCM is a big thing, but they've also got like the HBO originals and, you know, Studio Ghibli and like, they've just focused yeah. in on kind of really good, um, you know, areas and kind yeah. of given us that. And I'm like, good, you know, this is, this is good. Yeah. So, I mean, and they, and they separate it by like, like not really hubs. genres, yeah. but yeah, hubs like that. Yeah. Netflix. Like Netflix just needs some organization, really. Yeah, and they and then they get like Batman, you know, two months after it's in cinemas, and I'm like, yeah, HBO, you, yeah, yeah, you've it's got like, my money, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, um, and this is the way I want them to do. It. I know that last year they were like releasing them side by side, but like release them in the cinema, 
let them have the theatrical run and yeah, then exactly. be like, hey, we're bringing it to streaming. That's great. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Hopefully they just stick with that now that like um, cinemas are back open and stuff. Fingers crossed. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I th- think that's it. I think we're ready to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Sweet. Let's do it. Um, spoilers ahead, folks. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Um, the IMDb summary is a bounty hunting scam joins two men in an uneasy alliance against a third in a race to find a fortune in gold buried in a remote cemetery. Um, the first thing yeah. about it for me is just like the just the, another super simple setup. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know I think that we've said that about every. Um, every film so far is that it's a very simple premise. It doesn't, you know, it's not convoluted. It doesn't need your attention to see kind of what's happening throughout the plot. Right. Yeah. You like know. you get it. They're looking yeah. for treasure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but it's handled in a way that is not necessarily um, basic. Yeah. You know, it is, it's three hours long. So there's a lot of character driven plot points in there. Yeah. Um, but you know, overall, what a film! Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of crazy. Like I, I, this is probably the first Sergio Leone film that I had seen, and when I saw it for the first time, I think I've watched it because Quentin Tarantino said it was his like favorite film of all time, right? Yeah. And so when I eventually checked it out, um, I was blown away the first time I saw it because. I mean, it's 1966, and I was seeing things, like, keep in mind, I hadn't seen, like, Kurosawa. I hadn't seen, like, a ton of foreign films. Um, So this was, uh, there was a lot of firsts here for me. Like, I'd never seen something so modern looking, or modern modern in its technique. Yeah. But but that old. You know what I mean? Um, So, like you know, when they introduce the characters and like it freeze frames and then it's like the ugly. Yeah. And then they introduce each character like that freeze frame, the bad, yeah, yeah. the good. Um, I don't think I had ever seen that done. Like that feels like a more modern, like nineties, two thousands kind of thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously this movie was like doing it first and influencing other movies and stuff. Um, and then the angles, like all the shots and stuff, I it just, uh, I don't know, it was so much fun the first time, watching it yeah. for the first time, right? Yeah. Um, rewatching it, it was still a lot of fun, but it's interesting, like, going through Sergio Leone's filmography one by one, because now that I've uh, rewatched all three of the Dollars trilogy in a row, I really think that I like the second one the most personally, which I, which is interesting. Like I know Zach said the same thing, I think. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've been trying to figure out why that is exactly. I think the, the, uh, for a few dollars more, maybe it's just more fun. I don't, I'm, you know, I don't know if that's it or, yeah, um, I feel the same way as you. I mean, I I really enjoyed the good, the bad and the ugly. I think it's a really, I mean, it's a classic, you know, yeah. Um, but I can't believe that we don't, you know, for a few dollars more seems to be forgotten. In like yeah, the exactly. Of yeah. It's either this full of dollars that's talked about or it's this film. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm exactly the same as you. I, I did prefer um, for a few dollars more. Yeah. I had a better, I had like a more of a blast kind of watching it. Maybe the expectations are just too high for this. Maybe, you know, I went in expecting the best film I've ever seen. Which is always a worry, even though it was really good right. and I had a great time with it. It's like, can those expectations ever be met? Yeah, exactly. You yeah. Know, I mean, there is so much to love about this film, but I think mm-hmm. the things that I really love about the film are like the, well, obviously all the performances are great. Like Eli Wallach like stills yeah. the show. Yeah. Um, and we'll get back to him, but like the, 
the I think it's the technique that I love so much about these movies. It's like the big wide open landscapes where yeah. they're just empty and then all of a sudden like a face fills the entire frame. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um and everybody looks so gritty, you know, like we've talked about in the other movies. Um I love the zooming in, the the zooming in and zooming out on shots and the cutting and the music. Um all of that stuff which he does a lot of in the second one. Like the second one, I think uh maybe he had more fun with it, you yeah. know? And then this one tonally it, it's got a little more seriousness to it. Yeah. But like also reading like reading the biography, um it sounds like this film also had a lot more uh just tension. Yeah. On set, like it was a much bigger film. Like they shot it for one point three million dollars, whereas like the first one they shot for two hundred thousand. The second one was six hundred thousand, I, so. I think. Yeah, that reason. And then no. this one was one point three million, so much bigger budget. And then you've got three kind of leads, lead characters, yeah. which like again, like even though these and all these films are made like one after the other it's like the first one's 1964 then 1965 and now we're at 1966 so it's like that's a quick turnaround yeah this this film is a lot bigger there's a lot more people a lot more sets a lot more like explosions and dangerous stuff going on yeah and then i think clint eastwood also just was kind of grumpy (laughs) sounds like like he and he wasn't so sure about eli wallach like like in the script, it sounded like it, like he could tell that he was going to still show a bit, so he yeah. was like worried about that, like because he was, uh, you know, he wasn't like the Clint Eastwood yet, still, yeah. like when he's making he's this still movie. trying to make his name, yeah, yeah, exactly. So he's like trying to look, and he's coming off the end of his like they he had just finished Rawhide, which I think the last in the. In the entire series of Rawhide, he's like a secondary character. Yeah. And then towards the very like last few episodes of the show, he's like the main person of like the last few episodes yeah. of like the series finale or whatever. So as an actor, he's looking to go on to do something where he's he like he wants to make movies. He wants to be the star of, of films and stuff. You yeah. know, he's he's trying to build his career up. So for him to go back to Italy, you know, to do another film and to, um, you know, to do a film that he's not front and center is like, it feel it still to him feel, felt like, I think, a very unsure, like taking a risk, yeah. you know, it's like at the time you don't know that this film is going to be iconic. Yeah. <laughs> you know no, what I mean? No, it's yeah. like, you know, and I think anything worth doing or anything that has become iconic, you know, has always had some risk to it, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. so he's kind of rolling the dice. And then um, and then Eli Wallach and Sergio Leone got along really well during you the shooting. Tell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh like he's and, the muse in this film, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then yeah, and then um yeah, Sergio Leone and, and Clint Eastwood, you know, there was just it's not like they, they really ever got into it or anything. No. Like it wasn't like any huge problems, but they just there was tension, like yeah, you know I what think, I mean? I think I I heard an interview with Clint where, you know, this is hindsight, so he's kind of this was about ten years ago. But he said that, you know, while filming this, he had kind of, he wanted to go back to America and like, you know, make American films again. He was kind of, you know, and like you had said, you know, the other films hadn't really come out in America yet. So he hadn't made his name. This was the film that kind of, that broke him through unbeknownst to him. But I'm sure to him, it just felt like, you know, he's just kind of getting a paycheck, right? He's just making these films until... So he's got more on his reel so he can show, you know, this is who I am kind of thing. And the other Um, films had turned out well, you know. Yeah, exactly. Like, he knew that they were onto something, but the American audience didn't, you know. And that's kind of, you know, he could have got stuck quite easily making these for the rest of his life. And I'm sure at that point he was like, okay, you know, let's stretch 
the legs a little bit because yeah. he is definitely at his most wooden i would say in this one out of the three mm-hmm. you know all the humor that he had from the first one is kind of gone he's just a little bit yeah you know he's just kind of getting through it i think yeah um which but, isn't necessarily like bad for the mo- movie yeah. or the character you know what i mean no, yeah. like i th- i think you know if you watch this film as your first sergio leone film everything just works yeah you know i think yeah. because we're kind of going through all of the films and dissecting them and and learning about the history behind them and why things are the way they are you know we're reading into it a lot too yeah so and i think it's interesting that to say this is like everyone talks about clint eastwood and like this film and stuff like that that like he's only really the star of the first of these trilogy of this trilogy yeah like lee van cleef is the star for me for a few dollars more and it's obviously um eli wallach in this film he is the the driving force behind the story you know yeah yeah so it it was very strange to see that because i was pretty sure that clint would be the main guy in this film right yeah (coughs) yeah for sure um yeah there yeah it is interesting it's like but they all kind of share it you know a bit yeah. it's just Eli Wallach I think I mean he's I don't know I don't know if he's driving the plot forward or if he's just so his screen presence is just so known yeah you know like Clint Eastwood just looks good in every shot yeah. like like he looks so good um like his costume, like every everything is great. And then even like when he's like going through the desert, like the way that they shoot it and the the way that the shots are, they're like there's one shot where he like rolls down the the hill and like the yeah. sun is in the background and Eli Wallach is in the background on the horse. Like some of those shots, man, I'm just like incredible. Like yeah. it, it's just like such a there's just there's not much going on in the scene. Yeah. They're just walking through the desert, but like they make it look so incredible. Um, apparently, Sergio Leone was very influenced by like different painters and stuff. Like yeah. he liked to go to art galleries, and he had like a, he knew his taste in art, so he would look at a lot of different paintings and like show them to the cinematographer and people on set, and like this is what we're trying to shoot here in this shot, or yeah. like this is what we're trying to get here. Because um, there's so many shots in this movie man you can just pause it and it's like well yeah 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 i love it um what was your what what do you think your favorite scene was so i really enjoyed there was for for a number of reasons i really enjoyed when tuco is um goes to the village that's been like evacuated and he takes Mm -hmm. a bath um because I love the look of that like hotel. I love that it's bombed out and it's kind of like there's holes in the wall and the floor, you know, yeah. and it's like a real, it looks like it's just bombed, you know? Yeah. And I love his exchange with Blondie um, when he kind of comes up and then the one, the one armed <laughs> guy that's trying to get revenge on him. And, you know, yeah. it just kind of, and then what that builds to in, in terms of taking down the other five people with angel yeah. eyes. Um, I really like that scene a lot because it kind of just set up the end of the film. Um, yeah. There was a, I mean, there's a lot in this film that I really like. I think that it says a lot about things that I didn't think it would say a lot about, you know, but I'm sure yeah. we'll get onto that in a minute. What's your, what was your favorite like scene? I just it? love the ending, dude. Like, I think, I think the moment when like Tuco is, he gets to the cemetery. Yeah. And then like, just the way that it builds to that. And then he's, and then he's like, all right, I got to just start looking at every grave. And then he just starts going in a circle around every grave, just running and running and running and running. Like, I don't know. There's something about it that just makes it like, to me, one of the, like the best 
moments in a film that I think I've ever seen. Yeah. I don't I don't know. I think it's like the simplicity, like, and then it's the visuals, and it's the music. Like, the music is incredible in this movie. And then, but, but, like, wh- he's like, I, like, I don't know how they just got this shot where he's just like running in a circle. Yeah. And like, the they've got a long lens on it, which is it, it's a lot harder to like focus on a person when you've got a long lens like that. Yeah. Um, and he's just staying right in the center of the frame in focus. And the background is just like running by, but yeah. he's just right there in focus in the shot. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It just feels so fun. Like, yeah. It, like at that moment, like, and it's, I mean, and they're like searching for buried treasure. You know what yeah, I mean? It's exactly. like, it's like, uh, I don't know. It's just something about it that just so, like, it hits some kind of like cinematic peak. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? That that you just don't see in every film. You know yeah. what I mean? Um I, I think that's probably my favorite scene, even over like the the last the last part in the arena where they're like all their guns are drawn. Yeah. Which is also great. You it know? is good. Yeah. Um Paul Lever, yeah. please. <laughs> I, know. I don't I don't think he deserves the moniker of the bad. I was watching <laughs> yeah. I was like I don't. I don't think he's deserved the bad. You know, he's just he's just a bounty hunter. He's just that, like out to get this one-eyed bandit. You know. Yeah, I mean, other than the fact that he like murders this family in the beginning of the movie, but <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot about that. yeah, I forgot that he killed the kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, yeah, if they if he hadn't have done that, I think you yeah definitely because even yeah I was the same way when he got shot because I haven't watched the movie in a long time, I couldn't remember exact. I was pretty sure he died, but I couldn't remember exactly. But definitely after watching, you know, for a few dollars more, yeah, and then watching this, I was like, no, yeah, I know, you know. And then you feel feel the same way. Uh, when Tuco is when when yeah Blondie hangs Tuco on the cross I, I thought he was like literally gonna let him die yeah i thought he was just yeah, gonna no. kind of leave him there you know and we would have expected the shot to come because we'd seen what came before yeah but he would have just like that was it it would have just ended with him you know teetering on the cross kind of thing yeah yeah um yeah the tension there yeah. is so high even even now like you know having already seen it before like i was so tense yeah that moment yeah, because <laughs> you really he, don't want him to die. No, I love the way that it's directed as well, where he keeps looking still at the money. You know, he's on death's door, and what he wanted is right there in front of him. Yeah, and it's just that whole thing of like, I'm not going to get it. You know, I, yeah, like, it's literally in like touching distance. I've held it in my hands, and now I'm going to yeah. die. You know, yeah, um, yeah, it's so good. Yeah, it is really great. Um, Speaking of um, the bad, uh, apparently they, I was reading, they uh, messed up the marketing on the film. And in the trailer, they labeled Eli Wallach as the bad and Lee Van Cleef as the ugly. And like, (laughs) and it, and that just like, it ended up uh, like messing with Lee Van Cleef's entire career after that. Cause like, there's, they, like they labeled him as the ugly in like a bunch of other movies after this. They're like with the ugly, starring the ugly. Oh my god, Lee Van Cleef. He's anything <laughs> but though. He's such a like yeah. charismatic, you know, manly man. I don't understand. Like, yeah, <laughs> I did feel sorry for Eli Wallet when like his was the first. He came smashing through that window, and it was just like the ugly. <laughs> was uh-huh. the hell, man? <laughs> Imagine if that was um. your claim to fame. You know, yeah, exactly. What like one I of mean, these three is going to be me? Either the good, the bad, or the ugly. <laughs> it's funny because, like, you know, like in today's age, that would just that wouldn't have been able to happen. It's yeah. like, you know, if a a movie studio puts out a trailer with a glitch or a yeah, oh yeah, you know, a, a mistake in it, the internet just goes crazy. Yeah, and then they're like, oh, we'll fix that. I mean, like we were talking about Sonic the Hedgehog earlier. It's like that. That when the trailer for that came out, yeah. he looked totally different, and people were like, "This looks horrible." 
Yeah, change And they're like, okay, we'll fix it. <laughs> and they did. Like, it looks totally different yeah. in the final movie. Um, it's just kind of crazy. But yeah. Um, I really like that Tuco had like a whole character arc. Like, we met his brother, you know, and like... Yeah. There was these little added things to his backstory that that just kind of says a lot about not only, you know, the period that this film was set in, but also about him as a person you know like there was yeah. two ways out like one was to kind of follow religion and one was to become a bandit you know i chose yeah. the harder way or whatever he says it was just you know kind of says a lot you know about the time you know about the characters and i guess what it would have been like at that time you know there's no prospects out there yeah you know, what so he's just kind of it is money. interesting yeah, it is interesting that, like, you bring that up because thinking about it, it's like, yeah, we do get a we do get a sense of who Tuco is yeah. as a person, what his journey has been, because he's not exactly, you know, when the movie starts, he's not exactly, like, a redeemable character, no. right? Yeah. Um, he's he's pretty brutal and, and you he know, kills even... kills a lot of people in this film. Yeah, he kills a lot of people, like, you know, I mean, after he gets left in the wilderness by Blondie, you know, he comes in to a town and he, like, robs the the gun store with their own yeah. gun. Yeah, and, I love uh, that shop owner. <laughs> yeah, he's, he was great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just like, like, Sergio Leone is so good at picking these people. Yeah. Um, yeah, just like his blank stare on his face. Uh, and some of those shots are great. Um, but yeah, you get like a sense of who he is. And then in that scene with his brother, you kind of, he does like, he is kind of redeemable at that point. Cause you kind of understand like the journey that he's been on a bit, you yeah. know, um, and where he comes from and how he ended up there and, and everything. Um, and then the same thing with like the Lee Van Cleef character in for a few dollars more, you get some backstory, you yeah. know, by the end of the movie and you, and you, it, you get a sense of, okay, why he's become the way he is and why he is, you know, searching for this guy and why he needs to kill him and all that stuff. Um, you get that backstory, but with the Clint Eastwood character, I can't think of any moment except no. for maybe in a fistful of dollars, he says he knew someone he says something like, I knew someone like you once and they didn't they didn't have anybody to help them or something yeah. like that. Yeah. That's all it that's all. Like yeah. you like you have no idea where he comes from. Nothing. And he's not really the man with no name because he has the name in every movie, yeah. even though it's different. Um but but in a sense that I mean he is the man with no name in in that sense that we have no idea. We know yeah. nothing about this guy. Yeah. We don't know his, uh, we don't really know his reasons for doing anything that he does. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, which is kind of interesting that it still works so well. Like you're still interested in that character and you're still rooting for him in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you do get a lot of hints of, it's weird because like, that character, like I said, you don't know his reason for doing anything, but he, every time he does do something, like it doesn't feel out of place. You know what I yeah. mean? Anytime that he's like uh, brutal or just, you know, terrible or anything that's that would be considered immoral or whatever, like it doesn't feel out of character, and then when he does something that's just like an act of kindness, it also doesn't feel out of character. It's like yeah, the you know in the beginning he just leaves Tuco in the desert, like he just yeah. decides to rip him off in the beginning, and there's no explanation or reason. But you're like, all right, you know, yeah. you're not like that yeah. was weird, you know. It's like, like it it just feels like what he would do, yeah. And then like towards the end of this movie, you know, there's a there's a wounded soldier just laying there and he like takes his coat off and he puts it on him and he lets him take a drag off his cigar. Yeah. And, uh, 
And then, and then that moment he leaves his coat there and that's when he like picks up the poncho um, laying there. And the first time you see him wear the poncho in the film. Yeah. Um, I don't think anybody could have done that except Clint. Yeah. I think the fact that he is pretty wooden, you know, he doesn't give much away from his facial features. He's kind of, you know, the same really plays into this character. Like, you know, any kind of, I don't know, emotion shown on that face would have kind of started to ruin it a little bit. You needed him to be very, you know, you, you needed to not know what he was thinking most of the yeah. time for this to work. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, he says a lot about a war as well, the war that's happening and how it's just, you know, just a waste of good. I can't remember the exact quote, but he says it's, like, it's such a waste of good men. You know, everything yeah. that's happening, they're just blindly, you know, shooting at each other and killing each other and you know i think you get these little tidbits about kind of his personal beliefs but he's still not adverse to like taking down people that are following him yeah you know when him and angel eyes first set out and that guy literally just kind of comes out of the bush and he's just like bang he's dead you know uh-huh. there's no explanation he could have just been like a local guy going down through the stream to have a wash and clint's just like killed him <laughs> you know, so yeah, it's it's yeah, it's almost like the the less he says, the better. Yeah, sometimes yeah. I mean, but he does have really good lines too. He does, you know what yeah. I mean. Um, but yeah, he doesn't need to over explain anything, or like you don't need to know. Yeah, his backstory, and I think, I mean, I'm reading into it a little bit here, but I I feel like Sergio Leone probably. The more he worked with Clint, the more he understood, okay, the less we know about this guy, the better it works. Yeah. Um, there was some quote in the book. I think it was uh, Michelangelo who might have said, um, like that someone asked him why he picked a particular block of marble to sculpt out of like all these like hundreds of blocks of marble. And he said that he saw... God, I can't remember. He said, he said something like, "I saw Moses in yeah. this block or something like something that he ended up like shaping." Yeah, you know the block of marble. He saw that in the block of marble before he, you Stunned. know, that's why yeah. he picked it or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and Sergio Leone, he said, "When I saw Clint, I saw a block of marble. <laughs> <laughs> like I didn't see a block of marble yeah, to mold." Yeah, it's yeah. like I saw Clint was a block of marble. Yeah. Um <laughs> like he didn't see all these different blocks of marble or whatever. Yeah. Um yeah, uh which I thought was great cuz it's like okay, I can there's enough here for me to do something with. Yeah. 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 Um And, and it, it works would better be... for Tuco cuz Tuco is so um animalistic in a way he's mm-hmm. like he's so impulsive like things happen and he just kind of goes with it you know he's like a dog chasing his tail that those two characters re- work really well together because you've got the very stoic and then the kind of the ratty kind of you know um the ratty one in two cows so i think that those, yeah. those pairing work really well together i really wish we would have seen more of all three together yeah me too me too yeah because because I, I especially after a few dollars more, yeah, would have wanted more Lee Van Cleef. Yeah, I think here. I think the movie definitely works better if you watch this without any context. Yeah, you know, um, because it makes I think it it makes Lee Van Cleef more menacing. Like you get some charm in the other one. Yeah, so I think we have this desire of wanting to see that charm in this film, but the purpose of the film is to make him seem more menacing, more dark, more like, you know, just a cold stone killer. Um, doesn't care about anyone except himself. Yeah. Cause there's, you know, in the other one you find out he's doing it for his sister. Yeah. You know, in this one, like presumably we, you know, he has no family just for the money. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, I, I do. I feel the same way. It would have been would have been fun to see them together more. Yeah, or something, you know. But you know, there's that's why there's three films you go and watch. Rewatch that's right. Them. Yeah, 
if it was just the same film rehashed, you know, I'm sure it wouldn't be as popular. Yeah. So, um, but again, the same with <clears throat> Fear a Few Dollars More. I just like how the story kind of, it doesn't feel contrived at any point. It just kind of evolves. You know, mm-hmm. the first hour could easily have been just a, um, just rehashed by a character. You know, they could have just said, you know, we used to work together, you and I, Blondie, like you used to save me and we used to collect that money. And then you left me in the desert. That could easily have been summed up, but I really liked how it kind of, I don't know, how that story just worked, you know? Yeah. Like the plot points never felt like, okay, this is where we're headed now. It was like... Yeah, exactly, yeah. You know, it's just, it, it, it just felt very real and like... Very random. Yeah. Like in a lot of ways where, where life can be like that, where yeah. it's like you don't, you don't necessarily see it coming because it's like by the time... Yeah, by the time they're in the desert and they find out about the gold, you know, yeah. we're deep into a totally different plot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um and we don't exactly know how, you know, the bad character is going to collide with these other two yet. Yeah. Um and then it all just kind of comes together and then it kind of it turns into like this you know, comment on the civil war that uh, you know, I like I haven't. I mean, there's only a handful of Civil War films I think out there. I can't even think of a ton off yeah. the top of my head. But I mean, it's a very touchy subject matter. Um, I think hard to do, yeah. and please a lot of people. And uh, I mean, apparently, uh, apparently, <laughs> Sergio <laughs> Leone and. Uh, he was like dining somewhere and um, Orson Welles was there and he was like telling him about his, the script and stuff. And, and it was early in the development of this movie. Yeah. And Orson Welles is like, don't do it. He's like, do not do a movie about the Civil War. Like, it's just bad luck. Wow. Um, like, they're historically big flops. Well, I guess, I mean, <laughs> Which is kind of surprising because I don't... Decides. Decis- divisive divisive that's the word i was yeah. looking for um as a whole because i was like when i was watching it i don't know a lot about the civil war um, yeah so i kind of just googled like who was the good guys in the civil war you know just to kind of see <laughs> yeah you know, what like the uniform colors and stuff yeah exactly because uh, yeah <clears throat> that kind of thing isn't you know like ingrained in me i could probably take a guess and the answer that kept coming up was there wasn't you know really a good and a bad side. It was just two sides fighting for independence. One, you know, still believed in slavery and wanted, yeah, you know, people to be oppressed and kind of keep slavery, I guess, which is really bad, but that wasn't what the driving force behind it. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily a, you know, Nazis against everybody else. It's very much more, it was well. It was just a very ugly war. Yeah, just yeah. very like it was like brothers fighting brothers. Yeah, you know, and just a whole nasty time. I mean, needless. Yeah. You know, it's like obviously slavery is horrific, and it needed to end. Yeah. Um, and it's unfortunate that we had to go to war to get to to yeah. you know to get to that point. It's like. It's kind of a duh thing, yeah. But um, but it like reading in the book, it sounded like Sergio hadn't seen a lot of like. He's like mostly in films like they depict the North as like, um, as the good and the South as the bad, right? And yeah. it's like in, in a lot of ways that's obvious, but you know when you read the history books, it's like there was like like war is just ugly either way. Yeah. Like war, like war is dumb and stupid and and horrible and it's like and both sides get to this point where they're horrific you know like there's these concentration camps you know these prisoner camps and stuff where they you know they they have the other side prisoner and they torture prisoners and stuff and like you know doesn't matter what side you're on it's like torture is not a redeemable thing yeah yeah, you know what real. I mean. So I think that was like something that he 
he wanted to show was like the brutality of both sides and also just the ridiculousness of both sides. I mean, this is coming from a guy who, who, um, you know, was in Nazi occupied Italy as a yeah. child, yeah. you know, so he saw, you know, I think he's probably bringing in a lot of the, that stuff into this film. Um, because it's not, the film isn't necessarily trying to show you any kind of moral ground yeah. anywhere. Yeah. You know, it's really just like, like there's not a lot of, there, there really are no redeemable characters in this movie. I mean, really the movie is just the ugly, the ugly and the ugly, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then, and everyone else in the film is, is just as ugly, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, some of it did feel like when uh, Clint Eastwood and Eli Wallach are like going through the the different uh, military camps and stuff, felt kind of like um, Apocalypse Now. Okay, a bit like it's just there's so much going on. Like yeah. there's like there's so many people and like this war is just happening around them and yeah. they're just like sneaking through like they're yeah. just and it, i mean it, the scene of them carrying the explosive <laughs> like it's just the perfect example of what they're doing throughout this whole film yeah they're just skirting around you know the war in essence you know trying to blend in um like when you know, when they get towards the bridge and they pretend to stop to pick up the person yeah. to put on the stretcher and then just kind of carry on when yeah. the other stretcher's gone past was hilarious. It was really funny. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's just, that's what they're doing the whole film. They're just kind of trying to not get caught up in this war because they've got their own personal struggle. And I do, yeah. I do love it when they see the cavalry come in and like Tuco shouting and like, you know, like oh they you know they're gray coats they're like us and they you know and then they get there and they're just so dusty from the journey yeah. that they're just like the blue coats instead i thought yeah. that was brilliant you know it's <laughs> something I, I didn't expect you know um, yeah but this whole time it's just this is more of a distraction it's kind of in the way of them getting to the end this whole thing yeah. you know they get captured and then they kind of get caught up in it again later on and it's just you know it says a lot about war that I wasn't expecting. Yeah, exactly. And it's not, yeah, it does it in a way that only cinema can do, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's it's really, um, it's really because it's in the background, you know? It's like. Because yeah. a lot of it, Westerns show it as like, a lot of heroes have been to war. And a lot of like families have like, oh, my youngest son is fighting, you know, waiting to come back to the homestead or whatever. How the West is won has like John Wayne as a general. Like there's a whole yeah. segment of him kind mm -hmm. of giving this big speech about war and kind of like, you know, what why it's good, I guess. Um There's also Buster Keaton's the general, yeah, right? Yeah. I a can't think of any Yeah, set around that. I mean, I think I know most about the Civil War from films because obviously Birth of a Nation mm -hmm. yeah. is, you know, very um, orientated towards the South and the clan. Pro-slavery. Yeah. And yeah. The so, I mean, it's basically about, day. yeah, exactly. It's about, yeah, it's showing Klansmen as like the heroes in the movie. Yeah. And it's so weird to have a war film that doesn't have, you know, that isn't, I don't know, necessarily fighting for one side. Yeah. I feel like I came away and I was like, okay, like I kind of understand like who they were rooting for, but it's not like, okay, let's put our side mission on hold. We're going to go and help win the war, yeah. which would have happened in a lot of other films. I feel. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was reading too, that a lot of people think that this movie isn't historically accurate because people think that, you know, no, there was no civil war battles fought in Texas, and um, yeah. but it doesn't need it, to be. It's just that's well, the it doesn't, comment is making. You know, well, yeah, but apparently it is. It is uh, pretty accurate. Like there was okay, cool. like one battle there, and um, I can't remember. 
the it, it was there was something where Sergio was like he found out that like he had, he did his research like he did yeah. a lot of research and stuff and and um I mean even like the weaponry and like all that stuff like they shot this in in Italy so it's like or in Spain so it's like um you know the landscape is isn't you know the exact landscape or whatever but it still looks like it could be the the west or yeah. Texas you know but um you know he was doing his research and found out about uh, a battle that was fought in Texas and like went to um a historian in Washington DC like in like a a library archive or whatever yeah and even the guy at the archive was like you don't know what you're talking about that didn't happen and he's yeah. like let me go you know look through the books or whatever and then he comes back with like a stack of books and he's like you were right <laughs> Oh, wow. Here's all the information about this battle or whatever that happened. Um, so it's more accurate than than I think people realize. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's incredible. Like, like you can see why the film has been so influential. I mean, it's it's. You know, I mean, when we started this podcast, you know, you and I were a little like, like we made it probably sound like we didn't like it as much as we did, but yeah, um, just because we liked for a few dollars more, a little bit more, but I mean, you know, this this film is is still yeah amazing. Like it still holds up so well. Like it's we haven't it's, even talked about the soundtrack. Yeah, exactly. Like, like everything is elevated. Yeah, you know, like it's not just the you know the do 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 that's like really good. It's the the standoff at the end, the way that that music builds is just mm-hmm. incredible. Like it just makes it. You know, I was yeah. thinking like this is literally like a five minute shot of men looking at each other. Yeah, but there's so much <laughs> tension from that music and you know from the cutting and stuff like that. It's it's just done so well. Yeah, man, it's incredible. Like, yeah. It, yeah, it's 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 crazy that he was able to turn something like that into what what it is, like something yeah. so simple, um, and something he liked to do with uh, Morricone, the composer, was that he Morricone would write a lot of the music before they would shoot, and then they yeah. would play the music on set, um, and Leone would. Yeah, he would like shoot to the music, and then once they got into editing, he would edit it, and then Morricone would then go back and kind of perfect what the music yeah. he wrote to to make it fit even better to what wow. they had shot. So it was kind of like this process of music, shoot, music again yeah. to get it like really tight. That's and awesome. th- yeah, there's like no other. How else would you do that? It's like. I know. It's it's so perfect. Like the image to music, I don't think I've ever seen another movie do it so well than yeah. this movie. Like yeah. it is absolutely incredible. Well, except for maybe our film next week. <laughs> <laughs> it's the it's it's like the it's telling the story through the music. It's kind of like a silent film in some areas of just you know, the music can play a massive part in silent film. It kind of getting across these emotions and stuff. And I think that, you know, this does it really well as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, man. It's, it's like, <coughs> it's just beautiful. I don't know how yeah. else to describe it. It's, yeah. it's absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah, it, it's, but not without like a price. Like it, it, uh, like I said, there was like tension on the set. There was, yeah. there was a, f- I mean, there's it's a bigger budget, bigger crew. Um, I mean, the they had a mishap with the explosion, like the bridge yeah. that yeah. exploded. Um, it it was accidentally detonated before they had the cameras running, so they had to like go back, you know, go shoot yeah. other stuff and then rebuild it over several weeks. Oh, geez. Um, they uh, yeah, it was a, it was like another language barrier thing. Like they yeah. had to, they had a guy that was like supposed to hit the button. And he just like heard two people talking and they were speaking in another language, but he thought he heard them say go. Oh, gosh. And he yeah. went and no, no, none of the cameras were rolling. Um, and um, 
the editor on the film said that, like, he said by the time they got to the end of the cutting, he was like, Leone was a different person. He's like, I really? saw him, like, become someone else. Wow. He was like, uh, like, it just took such a toll on him. It was like, yeah. he was like, he was like, he was like, he was kind of himself throughout all of these movies, even into the point that, that, you know, we were editing. And then he's like, somewhere in the editing, he just like lost his drive. Like he wow. just, yeah. it was like, he didn't want to, he didn't even care to finish the movie. He's wow. like, he didn't care to meet the deadline. He was just not yeah. like, he just lost that drive, which I mean, I'm sure it did. Like, I'm sure it's just like the work, you know, yeah. took, took a toll. Like you, you're, you work so long and hard on something that, um, yeah, it just yeah. can beat you down. Um, yeah. but, uh, and then the film that we're talking about next week, which is the next film in his filmography is, uh, once upon a time in the West, another Western. Yeah. But it was clear, like, even even with the last few movies, like I don't think he wanted to keep doing westerns. No, yeah, and uh, but that's like where his career was going and what was working and what people wanted to keep giving him more money for. Mm -hmm. um, and so on the next film, he I don't want to say necessarily gave in, but he saw an opportunity to like, okay, well, let me do another western. Uh, but in the contract, it's going to be like, it's going to be all me. Like I get full creative yeah. control, which I mean, obviously he had most yeah. of the creative control in this anyway. I, I think he wanted this movie to be the good and the bad, and the ugly to be longer. Like the first, original cut was like over four hours Oh wow! <laughs> and they had to like cut it down, down yeah. to three hours. Yeah. Um, and, and so on the next one, you know, he got more money, more control, and uh, and he got to cast a couple of actors that he's been trying to get yeah. for all of these movies and finally yeah, got him excited. for this next one, which we will get into next week. But yeah. um, just a couple other things that I thought were great uh, reading about this film. Apparently, Bobby Kennedy, when he was campaigning for his presidency, uh used the term the good and the bad the ugly in one of his campaign speeches and that like cemented oh wow. the the term into like you know the yeah. american like lexicon mm -hmm. yeah exactly um which is great it's like yeah it is such a really great title and it's it like it, you know it's something that people say like you can fit it in yeah exactly in conversations all the time yeah um, and people know exactly what you're talking about as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then also I was reading that Eli Wallach after this film, uh, you know, he had a great time on the film. Like he loved working with yeah. Sergio Leone and stuff. And he went on to do, um, more Italian films. Yeah. One of which was a film called don't turn the other cheek where <laughs> he had a treasure map tattooed to his butt. <laughs> 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 and it just looks hilarious. Um, <laughs> it looks so wacky, and like I'm like, okay, I gotta find this film and watch it. Yeah, like, uh, oh yeah. It, I mean, just that plot is like, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, do you have uh, anything else about this film you want to talk about? I mean, I just want to kind of guess what you rated it. Yeah. Um, I think I think it's a five star classic for you. Yep, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah. Even though the like, even though I said like I, for a few dollars more, I think I enjoyed. Yeah, more. Um, there's so much in this film. Like the, to me, the the good and the bad. And the, sorry, the good, the bad, and the ugly is a masterpiece. It's like yeah. something that there's so many layers to. Like you're gonna get something else out of it every time you watch it yeah you know like living your life a little more and, and getting more perspective and learning more every time you go to it you're gonna find more yeah um and 
So that on top of just the technicality, the scale of the film, like it's just, it's something that blows my mind when I watch it. And I think, um, I think when a film reaches a level where I love it, but I also don't quite understand it completely. Yeah. Yeah is where it, it kind of gets to that point where it's like, okay, this is a masterpiece and I need to like watch this more and more yeah, um, to understand it and myself and all of those things. Whereas like for a few dollars more, even though, you know, like I said, I enjoy it a little more. I think I understand it. Like there's yeah. nothing there else to get. Yeah. I can just watch it and have fun every time. Yeah. It's not like I'm like, you know, trying to find something. Yeah, exactly. You know, um. Yeah, I don't know what you rated it. Hmm. <laughs> Let me think about this. I'm gonna say. Mm, I don't know. This is hard. Yeah, I'm <laughs> only, tricky. I, I have I got off. any of yours yet on any of the episodes? Have I got? Any I think of you got them? the last one. You said okay, four, and I said yeah, and then you said and oh, half. and then I well, yeah. that was like that was cheating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm gonna say. Gosh. Oh, Okay, I'm going to say four and a half. Bang on. Yeah, that's right. Nice. Sweet. Yeah, I think, like you said, I, I need to watch it again. I want to, you know, I feel like the same, I say this every week, but I feel like when you rewatch a film, you get a lot more out of it. And that kind of decides, you know, where it sits. Um, yeah. And if I watch this again and kind of took something different from it, maybe Clint's character is a little bit more interesting the second time around, or maybe, you know, there's a nuance they didn't quite get and it could bump it up to five. Um, but I had, a, I had a really good time with it. I enjoyed, I, I love the progression of watching him as a filmmaker, you know? Um, yeah. Just seeing what he does with a budget as well is very entertaining because, you know, this film is it's big, it's loud, it's, you know, there's these great set pieces, so. Yeah. It's, it's very memorable, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I can't wait to keep going, man. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, dude. So where are we going to rank it? I know that, you know, so we've got Colossus of Rhodes. I mean, it's pretty much Colossus of Rhodes at the bottom, uh, Fistful of Dollars, and then for a few dollars more is our number one at the moment. Yeah. Um, I think I would put this above again <laughs> Yeah. Uh, because I think, I don't know, I'm thinking of our, our ranking of these films as like a... Like, what film would I tell someone to watch first? Yeah, and it's weird that it's like all backwards right now. I know, but yeah. I think I would. I think I would suggest that someone watch the good, the bad, and the ugly before they watch any of these other films. Yeah, yeah. I what think as a think? film, I think as a filmmaker, this is the most complete package. Yeah, you know, there's every there's a lot going on in here, and it's handled, you know, very well. I think for my personal list i think it would go under for a few dollars more but i think you're right in terms of like suggest what people watch yeah you know this would be above. the one to watch yeah yeah i think it would be um, flipped i would have for a few dollars more once uh the good the bad and the ugly colossus of roads and then a fistful of dollars mm -hmm. i think that's like my personal ranking right now but in terms yeah. of the filmmaker ranking this yeah does go above the film you, church radio ranking that's right yeah are you putting off. together a, a ranking list on your letterbox I think, account i think i probably will when we've watched them all okay cool yeah yeah um or i could go Sweet. across and do it now you know I don't know yeah, what I mean, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you uh, want to go check that out, uh, it will be on Lewis's Letterboxd, which is Walker Lewis three zero zero seven. Letterboxd is a a um, social media app, I guess, for yeah. film lovers. Yeah, um, it's great. Basically, you can get on there and see what your friends have been watching, and log a film, and and rate it, review it. Um, which both of us do. Uh, mine is at Selman Scope if you want to follow me or Lewis. Um, and um, yeah, for me, it's just like a great app to keep track of what I've been watching because sometimes I forget. Yeah, and, same. And if you, you know, obviously there's paywalls on it as there is with a lot of apps, but if you pay 
hella likes for it has like stats so it tells you who you most watched by like actor director all that kind of stuff which i absolutely love i mean you know i love stats and facts and figures so yeah exactly yeah, yeah. um yeah it's been a lot of fun so go follow us if you would like and uh Again, next week we're watching Once Upon a Time in the West, the next film in yeah. the Sergio Leone filmography. Yeah. Exciting. No yeah, more Clint. I know. It's crazy. Yeah. It's going to be weird to not see him on screen. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited, though. I'm excited to see Me too. how this keeps evolving. Yeah. And we're, what, nearly half, I mean, we're over halfway through now. Yeah. yeah. Three more to go. That's right. Crazy. One last trilogy. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently they are a trilogy, but I mean, in as much as, you know. These were, yeah. These were. I mean, there's no like crossover actors. No. But um, yeah. Awesome. Tune in next week, folks. Um, this brings us to the end of the show. And you can also find us on all the social medias, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at film church radio um and all of our back episodes are streaming on all podcast platforms so you can uh go back and listen and and uh gain your cinematic enlightenment uh lewis do you have any advice for any up-and-coming filmmakers to quote tuco when you need to shoot shoot don't talk. <laughs> Honestly, that's really good <laughs> advice. I think I'm going to write that down yeah. on my board because I think I overthink films sometimes. Should get, I just need you, to shoot them. Yeah, you should get a tattoo with uh, Tuco in the bath. <laughs> yeah. With that coming out. It's like with a that, speech bubble. He's holding like a camera instead of a gun. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. There's another shirt, dude. We're going to have it. like a whole series of yeah. Leone shirts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Don't forget to say your film church prayers. Amen. Amen. (laughs) Bye, y'all. Bye.